next to my son. I'll never forget what happened to me here. Robbie, show him who the best in the world is. My father missed it in 67. Gary Wells missed it in 1980. After a 10-year dream, I'm gonna conquer the fountains tonight. Tonight, live from Caesars Palace in Las Vegas, Nevada, Showtime Event Television presents The Knievel Legend Continues. It is a warm, sultry night in Las Vegas, the scene right out of Hollywood, only this is for real. Upwards of 50,000 expected here at Caesars for an astounding event. They come from everywhere, all walks of life, many restrained behind the makeshift fencing. It's not very often the famous Las Vegas Strip comes to a dramatic halt, but understand the magnitude of this evening and you can see why. The mood tense, almost eerie, certainly curious, as this big crowd gathers to see a young man attempt to become the first to conquer Caesars. Hello everybody, I'm Steve Albert and welcome to one of the most extraordinary spectacles you will ever see. We are situated up above the anxious crowd between Caesars Palace and the Flamingo Hotel with a majestic backdrop, the famous fountains of Caesars. The drama and tension engulfing this event mind-boggling as young Robbie Knievel attempts to avenge his father's ill-fated mission at this very site 21 years ago. And he intends to make the jump with no hands. I'll be joined shortly by veteran Dave Diles who will serve as interviewer and field reporter plus motorsports expert Dave Despain. One thing we should point out immediately, Robbie Knievel has trained hard and prepared diligently for this jump. He is a professional. Don't get any wild ideas that anybody, including you, can perform such a dangerous stunt. When Evil Knievel risked his life jumping the fountains of Caesar's Palace back in 1967, the, uh, Robbie was only five years old, but he has seen the dramatic replay of his dad's crash here so many times, he feels as if he was actually here himself. There are many similarities and differences between the jump of 67 and the jump you're about to see tonight. The takeoff, the distance, and the all-important, if not crucial, landing area were major considerations in 67. They are indeed major factors here in 89. Here now, a closer look as we present a technical breakdown of tonight's jump with our expert, Dave Despain. The deceptive serenity of a flower garden provides the backdrop for the dangerous mission that Robbie Knievel is about to fly. It's 400 feet from that point to the ramp. 400 feet in which Robbie has to reach a speed of 90 miles an hour if he's going to clear the fountains. That means the first part of this trip is going to be a drag race, hard on the throttle, banging up through the gears and trying desperately to get to speed. Right here at the 200-foot mark, he has to make a decision. He can jam on the brakes here and still get stopped without plunging into the fountain or bouncing off that hedge. But past this point, he can't get stopped. It's the point of no return. And his only option is to run full throttle up the ramp and over the fountain to glory or to disaster. It's a choice his father faced 22 years ago. This jump is much more difficult than any other jump in the world. In other words, because of the fountains being in your way, right in the middle of the jump, you can't make a test run and go around it. The problem with this jump is that once you're back there in that fenced off area, you're committed. It's like going down the runway in a, in a fighter jet or taking off of an aircraft carrier. You don't get no second chance at it. You have got to be on the money when you go. When my dad did it in 67, there's only really one place to jump it now. And uh, that's right in the center between the sixth and seventh tree. When he jumped, he was out towards the strip more, and um, I think, I was only five years old, I wasn't even here, but I think the wall was uh, way over there on Flamingo Road, so he had nothing to worry about. And when Gary Wells jumped it in 1980, uh, he had the new walls, the pillars, and the underground parking, 
and of course he hit the wall. But um, I've got uh, a new pillar that holds up the people mover that wasn't there when Wells jumped, and it's like 60 feet from my landing ramp, and it's going to be tight. The Knievels, very different men. Evil big league showman, Robbie, party animal. Father, notorious crasher. Son, skilled and talented jumper. Their lives intersect at these plywood ramps. The takeoff ramp is the most important. Um, the landing ramp's got to be wide and long, and that gradual, that gradual slope just helps out a ton on the suspension. But the takeoff ramp I designed, and out of experience of seeing my dad's old ramp. Good, I know. My ramp will be nine foot high, my takeoff ramp. His takeoff ramp were only six foot high. I've hired my takeoff ramp by three feet, and I add a kicker onto the bottom of it. So it, it makes things a little smoother. I like paint my own stripe, helping build the ramp, and I get the feel of everything. Feel more confident. I only got myself to blame. Robbie learned that from his father, the ultimate truth of the business. The daredevil always flies solo. Robbie's flight path will carry him roughly 180 feet across those fountains, which hold such fascination for motorcycle jumpers and for those who hype their feats of daring. Yes, there have been longer jumps, but the fountains, uh, they stand unconquered. Robbie will launch his attempt from a four foot wide, 38 foot long takeoff ramp it is nine feet high, 12 and a half degrees, most significantly, the highest takeoff jump that he has ever attempted. Most critical to success is the landing ramp. At 12 feet wide, it's three times the width of the takeoff, seven feet high, 75 feet long, and provides the most gentle landing possible. That's critical because the real obstacles lie ahead, and we'll get to those in a moment. The portion of the jump that makes headlines, the 150-foot gap, 30 more than his father jumped, Robbie will clear it at a height of 23 to 26 feet. The many changes since 67 make this attempt more difficult, but bike evolution works in Robbie's favor. Back in 1967, the bike that my dad used, I mean, there was like half, half the suspension that there is on my bike today and what Gary Wells used. And, uh, you know, it only takes one little mistake. I mean, these, these bikes are real high tech now. They handle great, they got great suspension, they go fast, they stop quick, they got disc brakes. I'll change the handlebars to fit me, the grips. Um, probably set the shock to my weight, and that's about it. Modern motorcycles are so good indeed that Robbie doesn't need a lot of modifications. His bone stock motocrosser, water-cooled, makes about 60 horsepower. It's geared to run over 100 miles an hour. Unchanged in this jump equation, two things. The looming danger of the fountains and the magnetic appeal of the daredevil personality. Failure here made his father rich and famous. Robbie hopes success at Caesars will do the same for him. This X is the key to that success. It is Robbie Target on the landing ramp, and from here, he must negotiate the obstacles that have added so much danger to this attempt. He wants to hit here very square, get on the brakes hard, and scrub off as much speed as possible. His worst fear is landing over here to the left because that would put him on a collision course with that new people mover column. Let's take a walk down here and see what Robbie will see. Keeping in mind, he'll come through here at 80 miles an hour. Now, he figures at that speed, he's only going to get one steering maneuver. And if he has to spend it to dodge that Caesar sign, that first column that holds up the people mover, then he's in trouble. He's liable to end up in the hay bales on the right-hand side, or perhaps worse, veer down into the entrance to the parking ramp and be on a collision course with the second column further down the ramp. What he wants to do is come through this area dead straight and hard on the brakes, slowing down as much as possible. That way, when he gets to about here, he can use his steering maneuver to dodge dart just a little bit to the left into the waiting arms, the opening, if you will, of the parking ramp. And from there, he'll have 126 feet to safely stop before he hits the hay bales back at the end there, back at the back wall. Now, they mocked this all up in a practice session out in the desert and rehearsed it at three-quarter speed. And in that rehearsal, Robbie's mechanic liked what he saw. He said, based on what he saw there, that Robbie, by the time he gets to here, will be slowed down to the point where he can go anywhere he wants to. I asked Robbie where he'd stop. 
And he frowned and said, I don't know. I won't know until I get there. We're just about 100 yards from where Robbie hopes to safely land. There's a sort of an eerie confidence uh, pervading this whole atmosphere. It has been that way all week. Robbie, it's true that you have a better bike, you have a better ramp than did your father more than 21 years ago. But you are attempting something uh, where there's an 0 for 2 record, your father and Gary Wells in 1980. And in a sense, it's a more difficult jump. What makes you think you can do it? It's the year for entertainment. <laughs> um, I could use a little help tonight. It's been a long day. Um, I'm a little nervous finally it comes down to the jump. I've been waiting for this for 10 years, and uh, it's already here. It was... Why do it at all? Well, I've been in this business forever. There'll never be another Evil Knievel again, but uh, you're looking at one guy who's his son who learned from him that will make this jump. And uh, I like being an entertainer. I like being in the spotlight. And I think I've had the most experience out of anybody as far as to make this jump. So tonight I'm going to show everyone I can do it. And then I won't be known as this crazy daredevil. I'll be known as a great entertainer. When you made your final inspection today and when you did your practice runs yesterday, what was going through your mind in the way of final preparations? Final thoughts? Well, today I went out and made uh, some practice jumps. I jumped about 120 feet to where I landed. I'm going to land here at about 180 or 190. The X is marked, marked 180. And I'll be hitting down there somewhere. If I can just miss that first pillar and uh, get the brakes, I should be in good shape. I should be able to swerve to the left and stop before I get to the back wall. Robbie, final question. <clears throat> you call it paranoia, or you might call it the suspicion of, of two reasonable men, but all week long, you and your father somehow seem persuaded that Gary Wells, who failed here in 1980, will try to do something, even in these last minutes, to uh, at least upstage you, or at worst, sabotage this whole event. You're worried about that. I'm not worried about it at all. Um, I'm way past a guy like Gary Wells. Uh, Gary had his shot. I think he knows it's my shot. I think he's going to stay clear. Um, there's no possible way for him to come in here in the first place. And uh, we had a little talk with him earlier anyway. Your, your people met with his people. Are you saying that? Good friend of mine, uh, Spanky Spangler, uh, had a little talk with Gary. He's known him for a long time. Besides that, I got Super Dave and Boom Boom Mancini here ready to go. We'll be back. And no doubt many of the people here in this big crowd tonight to see if 26-year-old Robbie Knievel can clear the fountains and land safely were here back in 1967, when then 28-year-old Evil Knievel was the first to attempt this jump. The jump that launched a remarkable and somewhat unbelievable career. With that, here is a profile of Evil Knievel. This is Butte, Montana. Back in the 50s, Butte could be described as a tough, almost wild west, undisciplined kind of town. A town best known for its mines. Today, it's best known as the town that produced Evil Knievel. When Evil was just a young boy growing up in Butte, his parents were divorced. So he was raised by his grandmother. His father moved out west to San Francisco, but Evil and his brother used to visit him. When Bob was, you know, as a young boy, uh, we did we did a lot of things together. Uh, his grandmother, my mother, used to bring him down to California. I was in California most of the time. And uh, I was interested in sports car racing and motorbikes, and I think I got him in the first one he ever had. It was uh, something I think I took in trade on a car, a BSA, a small one, whatever. My dad didn't want to see me get into the motorcycling as deep as I did because he'd seen me get hurt. I will have to confess, however, that the jumping, uh, that, that got to me. And uh, when I say I, I uh, try to talk him out of this, you know, for quite a long time, and frankly, I realized that there was no way. I participated in three of the 
lowest bank sports in the world, hockey, rodeo, and motorcycling. So I thought that since Honda, for instance, had done such a great job with the slogan, you meet the nicest people on a Honda, that the motorcycle people would support a motorcycle daredevil show like Joey Chitwood and his auto daredevils. So I formed a whole show, and I had about 10 guys working for me. I got hurt very badly in the second show we had in Barstow, California. I used to do a stunt where I stood in the middle of the racetrack and they would run a car at me or a motorcycle and I would squat down into a jumping position and just before the car hit me or the motorcycle I would jump in the air and spread my legs and it would go underneath me. Well, I missed the jump in Barstow and the motorcycle hit me head on right in the groin and knocked me about 15 feet in the air and I did three backflips and landed on my back and I was, I, I never got hit so hard in my life. I was out of breath and my eyes were open and the California Highway Patrol pronounced me dead and covered me up with a blanket. But evil survived and eventually came here to Caesars Palace in 1967 for the real launching of his career. We paced off the distance between the curbs and, uh, if I remember right, it was exactly 142 feet. So I set the takeoff ramp up back about three or four feet and the landing ramp back about three or four feet. So actually I had uh, about 145 or 150 feet to cover. I was just slow on takeoff. I didn't know it. I thought I was right on the money. But that's the problem with that jump. When you go there, you think you're on the money, but it's an altogether different task. You can't make a run by it two or three times and have your man come up to you and say, you're going a little slow, you better get with it. I never had a, tack a tachometer or a speedometer on my motorcycle. I always did it just by the seat of my pants. And I was only really one foot short. But the safety ramp was so flimsy that when I landed on it, the motorcycle suspension was the shock absorbers they had in those days. I jumped it with a 650 Triumph Bonneville. And it just... I mean, there was just no way I could hang on to it. I was running about uh, 85 miles an hour. If I'd have been running 90, I'd have made it. After Caesar's Palace, he went on to Seattle in 1970. Then, on to the Houston Astrodome in 71, where he successfully leaped over 13 cars. However, later that year in Yakima, Washington, it was a totally different story. He got in the air and just nosedived on it. And I just couldn't hang on to it. And I fell off and I broke my collarbone. I'll tell you something, that, that pavement is a pretty tough competitor. It's tough when you hit it. Uh, I've had a lot of guys ask me what it feels like. I told them just get on the hood of your car and have your buddy drive you down the freeway and when he gets to 80, you bail off. You'll find out what the hell it feels like. I came down the ramp and I made it across the jump and I fell off out in the parking lot and hit a pole and almost killed myself. I think I jumped 52 cars there, but they were stacked on top of each other. It was a long jump. And I came down a huge ski jump ramp from the very top of the course. And I made the jump. The jump that uh, they say it is the one that holds the record with Wide World Sports, the one I did in Texas, where I jumped the 14 Mack trucks. I jumped so far that you can see from the film, I landed at the very bottom of the ramp. I broke my back that day. There were thousands and thousands of people there, and they barely got me back to my dressing room with a broken back. at the Canadian International Exposition. That was the last jump I made before the Canyon jump. And that was the first time that Robbie and Kelly both ever performed with me. And I jumped 14 Mack trucks in. So I went to Twin Falls and I leased that property from a landowner named Tim Qualls, who is uh, now the chief of police at Twin Falls. But the other side was owned by the Bureau of Land Management, Department of Interior. 
They tried to stop me again. I just told them to go to hell. I said, look, I'm going to jump it. I'm going to land on your property, and if you don't like it, just shoot me out of the air because I'm going to go anyway. You cannot stop me. I own this property. If I want to jump in the canyon, I'll do it. The Sky Cycle, the first one was built by a guy from Chicago named Doug Malwicky, and it was a very nice-looking rocket. Uh, he just built the prototype for that reason. We tried to fire it across the canyon. We're right in the middle of it. And Truax built two of them. It cost me probably a quarter of a million dollars. You know, the second test shot went right in the river. Now I ran out of money. I had the date. I had to go. Five, four, four, three, two, two one. This seatbelt harness safety strap I was in, all I needed to do was hit a button on my chest, and it was supposed to open up. And I couldn't get it open. Now, if I'd have went in the river, I'd have drowned because I'd have been strapped in it and I'd gone right down. I could have never got out. And if I'd have hit that thing and opened it and then gone into the rocks, I'd have been killed because I wouldn't have had a safety belt harness on. I remember J.C. Agajanian telling me, he said, you know what? He said, I think it worked out just right. He said, if you'd have made it, everybody would have said it was easy. And if you'd have died, people would have said, well, the daredevil should have died. Uh... He said, you did it, you missed it, you're still alive, and uh, someday your son might do it. And I've always said that it's a pretty tough thing to do. I have I was just in Twin Falls, Idaho the other day, and I didn't see any big, long line of daredevils standing there wanting to jump across the canyon. I didn't realize that the jump was going to be so long. The buses were bigger over there, they're wider than ours are. And Harley Davidson didn't have a chance to send me the right gearing even on his jet in time before the show when I realized it. I only had one day to go there and set up and practice. So I tried it and I just landed short. And I tried in every way I could to hang on to that motorcycle. It was like bulldog and a steer. I mean, I, I hung on to it from the very top of the ramp all the way to the very bottom, trying not to let go of it. And when I came off, I was going so fast, I slid ahead of the motorcycle. But I'll be damned if it didn't come right after me and land right on top of me and just burn me to burnt my skin something terrible, exhaust pipes. But I was unconscious for quite some time before they got, got me up. So it was a, it was a bad accident, very bad accident. I've got to tell you that you are the last people in the world who will ever see me jump because I will never, ever, ever jump again. I am through. When I came back to the United States a year later, I announced I was going to jump again. But that I thought 13 was an unlucky number, I was going to jump 14. And that I was going to do it in Cincinnati at Kings Island. I made that jump successfully. The motorcycle broke right in half when it landed. It was a long jump. I knew the jump was dangerous. There was no exit. When I landed, I had to go right straight up a ramp up to the top, and they were going to grab me with steel hooks up there and hold me. And I mean a straight ramp that went right up to the top. And I got on my motorcycle, and I told this camera crew they could put one cameraman down there. And that was all, just one. And that I was going to make the jump, and they better get it the first time, because they weren't going to get a second shot at it, because I knew I was in trouble. And when I landed, that motorcycle went out of control, hit that cameraman head out, head, head on, hit the cameraman head on, knocked his eye out, broke both of my arms and knocked me unconscious and knocked me in the motorcycle right through the grandstand. Anyway, after that accident, I went back to Fort Lauderdale. And I could not play golf, which I love to do every day. I could not play golf for years. I hit a golf ball. The steel plates in my arms just hurt me so bad. And there were some doctors that said that they didn't think that I would ever heal up. I was in a cast for so long that I just thought, this is ridiculous, I can't heal up anymore like I did uh, when I was 25 or 26 years old. And my arms hurt me so bad that uh, I just had to quit, period. I just had to quit, I couldn't take it anymore. And I have had Robbie and Kelly with me many times in ambulances and held them in my arms and on the way to the hospital while I was still conscious. I would tell them, look what is happening to me. Look what I'm going through. 
You both have to promise me that you'll never do this for a living, ever. Promise me. And they just look at me and I said, promise me. And they said, we promise. We won't do it. The drama continues to build a big crowd waiting patiently but nervously for the Knievel legend to continue. Let's go back to Dave Diles with Evil Knievel. Okay, I'm just telling Evil, I know firsthand I had a marvelously brilliant father and a bright son. But my father got brighter as I got older, and I hope that my son someday will think I'm smart. Your kids obviously never listened to you when you told them don't ever do that, and they assured you they wouldn't. Well, Dave, nobody can tell a young man what his life is supposed to be like. Robbie is the master of his own ship. In this case tonight, I think the wind is maybe blowing in the wrong direction, but I hope he can handle it because he's going to have to. Evil, you know as well as I do that some people will say, you're a little league father who is pushing and prodding your child to do something that you could not do. Well, that's one of the most ignorant statements I've ever heard made in my life. My, I wouldn't expect that from you. My son is 26 years old. He's a young man. He's not a kid. I tried to stop him from jumping. I couldn't get the job done. And if you don't be careful, when this is over, I'm going to send him to you, and you can babysit him for a couple of weeks. You'll find out what kind of a kid he is. Well, your relationship with him has been turbulent at times. Not uh, much different than any other father's has with his kids. I'm sure it has not, but you have urged him, most of all, to be careful. Down deep in your heart, you still don't want him to do this, do you? Well, if you were going through what I'm going through right now, with my mind and my heart, you'd know that I don't want him to do it, then. Robbie has had this dream for a long time, and he came here with 20 years experience. When I came here, I came here with only 10 or 11 years experience. Robbie is a, absolutely the best performer in the world, and I think he'll get the job done. You want to salute him and walk out and say, long live the king. I am not the greatest daredevil in the world. I hope after this is over, I will be the father of the greatest daredevil in the world. Okay, Evil Knievel, moments before the jump. The overall view here in Las Vegas, this is where Robbie Knievel will soon launch himself, he hopes, into superstardom. He'll soar about 160 feet to the landing ramp at the other end, where he will have to negotiate a very narrow area as you take a look as we follow through with our cameras here at Caesars Palace. There's a good close-up of the takeoff ramp. They'll have to go over the fountains, not get any water on the wheels so as to prevent a slick landing. There's the landing ramp, the obstacles below, the challenges to his right, the pillar to his left, the pillar, the bales of hay, and in he goes into the underground garage. There's almost a sense of New Year's Eve in Times Square when you look at the awesome crowd here waiting for the magical moment. You know, back in 1967, Evil Knievel was the first to attempt this death-defying leap. However, somewhere in the crowd that particular day was a 10-year-old boy who saw Evil and said, I want to do that someday, too. Well, that boy's name is Gary Wells, and that someday came 13 years later in the year 1980. Gary Wells was only the second person to attempt to jump the fountains at Caesars Palace. For Wells, that September morning was filled with promise. September 15, 1980, was a very special day in one way, and in another way it was the same as many others. I was attempting a motorcycle jump 
over the Caesars Palace Fountains in Las Vegas, Nevada, which is where I happen to grow up. And the day started by uh, waking up at 6 in the morning to uh, set the ramps, make sure the equipment was prepared and lined up properly. And for some reason, my takeoff ramp had been moved in the six hours prior to my setting it. And at jump time, it was two degrees off. We've had five approaches so far. This appears to be at a 90 miles an hour. He's up, 23 little gray wheels. He's missed it. He's in trouble. He's in trouble. He's down. He's hurt. My God, he's not even moving. He's hurt. He's hurt. I knew the second that my eyes cleared the top of the ramp. I knew immediately. So I missed the landing ramp and had a very spectacular crash. I hit a brick wall with my body head on at 85 miles an hour. The impact of that, I had to have open heart surgery, steel plates put in my legs, and uh, it was real. It was right in front of the people. People were standing within 10 feet of where I had that impact. Against all odds, Gary Wells not only survived his near fatal accident at Caesars Palace, but emerged from this crash with his courage still intact. Everybody takes risks. I just get paid for it and I enjoy it. If there's not a risk in life, life's a bore. At Bic, we've been studying all the ways that you... It is almost Robbie Knievel's turn as he becomes just the third person to attempt this feat, but Robbie is anything but new to this game. He has trained and prepared hard for this jump. He's been in the business for about 20 years. Interestingly, he does not consider himself a daredevil. Let's learn more about the career of Robbie Knievel and find out what he has accomplished. Robbie Knievel, born into a career, born to the world's most famous daredevil. Robbie was riding on his father's motorcycle as far back as he can remember. Taking over the family business came naturally to Evil Knievel too. These days, he prepares diligently in the desert near Las Vegas for his jump of a lifetime. Meanwhile, in his earlier years, Robbie and his older brother Kelly learned from their dad. By 1971, they appeared with Evil for a motorcycle bow before a full house at Madison Square Garden. But his big break came in 74 in Toronto. By the time I hit age 11, I did a show with my dad at the Toronto National Exhibition. I have quite a home in Butte, Montana, and we have eight acres, and it's surrounded by guards, and one of the guards came to me, and he said, Evil, I'm having a heck of a time with the tourists out here at the gate. He says, you're paying us 24 hours to keep the tourists so you can have your privacy, and he said, that little guy's got a sign up on the gate that says, see, Evil Junior jump, only 25 cents. He said, I can't keep the people out of here. wanted them to perform with me and do some writing under my guidance at the last performance I would ever have before the canyon jump and this is that performance and I would like you to meet my sons Kelly and Robin My brother did a wheelie show. That was the last show my brother ever did with us. And I walked out at 11 years old and got on a, a 125 that was twice the size of me. And, uh, I could go through the gears all the way across the football field. It was it was so funny. I mean, the crowd was just up in a roar, you know. It was like this little guy on this bike. Neat, 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 neat. So it was great. Um, it was that That's when I was like, Hey, I want to do this for a living. And yes, he did. By 1976, Robbie was a regular on his father's tour. He performed with his dad during shows, learned from the best, gathered invaluable experience, got to see the country. January 1988, in the Houston Astrodome, a friend of mine called me up, a stunt friend of mine that's been around for years and does all different kinds of car stunts and stuff. He says, listen, if I were to jump my car head on at you, would you be interested in jumping your motorcycle coming the other way, head on over the top of me? And he would come off, destroy my takeoff ramp completely a half a second after I went over him. And I would clear his takeoff ramp because it was a lot shorter. 
and I'm blind. I'm coming out of a tunnel. I can't even see him. All I can see is this flag drop, and I'm sitting there revving, and I go, 1,000, 2,000, and I just go, you know, as fast as I can, and I come off this ramp, and I must have jumped 160 feet to the ground. Flat. Knocked the wind out of me instantly. I barely held onto the bike. I, I had plenty of room, you know. <laughs> I was lucky, and he just, he did exactly what he had said. He came and went, destroyed my takeoff ramp completely. Portland was kind of easy, because it was out in the middle of nowhere. I almost flipped the bike over, but I was on a, a big racetrack at the Nissan Grand Prix. And uh, I had plenty of room, nothing to worry about at all, except getting from point A to point B. I got the perfect speed, and I hit right in the middle, middle of my X, right where I wanted to hit. And, uh, did a no-hander quick because I started going over. I just came off the ramp a little bit the wrong way, and that's, Caesars, I'll be jumping a lot further. When you start jumping 160, 170, 180 feet where I want to land, you're really talking about coming off that ramp at that speed just perfect to kick up the rear end a little when you're flying through the air so you don't end up backwards. I mean, if my dad, when he landed at Caesars, if he would have made it over the safety ramp, he was back so far that he probably would have flipped over and crashed anyway. But uh, when you start getting back at that point, at that speed, you start losing sight and uh, you get weak. It's like, should I let go or stay with it? It becomes more dangerous when you can't make practice runs by the side of the ramp like I can't at Caesars. All I can do is make run-ups to the ramp but I gotta stop short. And uh, I mean, I gotta start stopping soon. And it, it's, it's, it makes it so much easier when you can go by at full speed and just get that feel going by the ramp. And then slowing down on the other side, checking out and being able to go by the side and view the whole distance. That's one thing that could screw me up. for the thumbs up from Robbie Cadeva. He'll be making some practice runs prior to. the build-up, the endless news conferences, the satellite hookups around the country, all but a memory now. The only thing on Robbie Knievel's mind right now, getting safely to the other side. It's a long way across. Of course, in all of his previous jumps, he could continue on during these practice attempts but he's got fountains in front of him this time so he's got to stop at a certain point and go back unlike his father who broke 35 bones during his 12-year career robbie has thus far managed his success at less cost in injuries robbie like his dad a terrific athlete Here's a report from Dave Despain. We have seen Robbie make his first run up at the ramp. The hazard here at the fountains, as several have alluded to, the fact that he cannot do a flyby. Here comes his second run. He needs to get into fifth gear to make the jump. He's only able to run into third gear on these approaches. He needs to get, you hear the crowd reaction. They're loving this. They're ready for the excitement that is to come. He needs to get to about 85 miles an hour in order to successfully cross the gap. Because he cannot test that speed, he cannot run by the ramp at 85, he has to just give it the best shot that he can. His mother and sister look on as this young man tries to anticipate what he's going to need to get to the other side because he cannot truly test 
what he needs to get there. So these run-ups are the closest approximation he can get to the actual jump conditions. Thank you very much, Dave. Robbie Knievel has made two run-ups thus far. You just saw the thumbs-up indication. Here we go. This may be it. a lot of folks the third run-up Robbie obviously didn't think it was the time and only he knows best as you look at the expanse here at Caesars Palace in Las Vegas as the tension builds He's had three run-ups. Chatting with his crew. Dave Despain has more. Dave? Bill Rundle thought there was a good possibility that that might be the jump. He was waiting for Robbie. Robbie elected not to come. Bill, did you think that was going to be it, and is there any problem? No, he's going to come this shot, I think. This is it? This is it. We're ready. You've seen him do this a lot of times. Is he going to make it? He's going to make it. Bill Rundle says this is it, and he's on his way. <laughs> Bill, he's making you nervous, I can tell. I'm getting a little nervous, yeah. But we're, he's going to go over it. I've got a lot of faith in him, and he'll go this time. How does he know when the time is right? Whenever it feels right to him. None of us can tell him how to do it. You know, he's on his own. From what I've seen of this young man this week, I think that sums it up right there. He does this very much by the way it feels. He's doing this by the seat of his pants. Notice that that motorcycle has dirt track tires on the back, knobby tires. They're not designed to run on plywood. They're not designed to run on the asphalt that awaits him at the other side. They're designed for dirt. He says they'll cushion the landing better than a street tire. He told me that the first time I asked him about him. I pointed out that a street tire would stop him more effectively and that that seemed to be a key on the other side. And he looked at me and grinned and says, well, these tires just feel right. And I think when you get to the bottom line, this mission he is flying very much by the seat of his pants. When it feels right, he'll go. If the speed feels like it's there, he'll make the assault. Forget all the angles, forget all the physics, forget all the dimensions of the ramps and all the rest of the discussions that have gone before. When it feels right is when Robbie Knievel is going to do it. And if he's flying accurately by the seat of the pants, he's going to fly right into history. Again, Bill Rundle predicts this time will be it. We'll know, I think, when he comes sailing across that ramp. Steve? Let us see, Dave, if five is a charm.
Hi, Robbie. You're here with your wife, Lauren, and your daughter, Christian. When you were at that point where you said, I'm going to come up short, what in the world went through your mind then? Uh, hang on, because I thought I was going to land short like my dad and uh, have to deal with what he dealt with. Tell me about the practice runs. You had to sense were... that that was just the right time. See, I, I, didn't, I haven't even been out here on a bike to make the run at the ramp. But I had to shut down by the time I got to fourth gear each run. So I was in fifth gear going as fast as I could go. And uh, that's why I, I come up short. I should have been doing 85. I was probably doing 75 when I left the end of the ramp. Thanks, let's, thanks. let's look at the monitor here. You can see it. You tell us about it. I was shifting as fast as I could and as much as I could. This is Caesar's Palace. You got one shot. Come on, let go. <laughs> <laughs> let me bring Lauren in here as she looks at it. Lauren, the wife of Robbie, she's looking at him almost for approval. <laughs> Are you gathered enough to tell us what you were thinking before he did it? Well, I knew that he would make it, but I, w I was a little worried. <laughs> And How about you? Were you worried about your daddy? Not worried at all, huh? No. No. <laughs> you could do it by yourself. I have a daughter like that, Robbie. Thank you very much, Dave. And Robbie Knievel, the heir apparent to Evil Knievel, has successfully jumped the fountains of Caesar's Palace here in Las Vegas. Just an unbelievable, spectacular scene. We'll take another look. Dave Diles is standing by with Dave Despain for some final comments. Fellas? I said a couple of days ago to our executive producer, Jim Spence, uh, when I tried to capture the essence of the moment, I said that it's indescribable almost. I'm not a motorcyclist. Troy Rutman, whom you know, uh, youngest man ever to win the Indy 500, once gave me a motorcycle. And I hate to tell you, Troy, but I'm afraid to get on it. But this really had me going. I love motorcycles. And I know I you do. The intensity of what we saw this man do with his motorcycle is really the essence of it. The danger is, is terrifying. Had he crashed, it would have been horrible. Point is, he didn't. Point is, I think that the fascination with this fountain can now be left behind. It has been conquered. No one else has to come here and get hurt trying to do that. And I think that's a good thing. And as far as the motorcycling experience, I had the chills running up and down my back. <laughs> Even an old veteran gets the chills. Uh, I have to go change shirts, Steve Albert. All the anxiety, all the butterflies, all the apprehension, they are all finally behind us. Now that Robbie Knievel has conquered the fountains of Caesars Palace, what's next? Is it Wembley Stadium? Snake River Canyon? Who knows? One thing's for sure, though. Robbie Knievel can sit back, relax, breathe a deep sigh of relief, knowing full well he is the king of his profession. He has avenged his father's crash. Yes, the Knievel legend continues. For Dave Diles, Dave Despain, our entire crew, Steve Albert saying good night from Las Vegas. This telecast was a production of Sports Television International and has been a presentation of Showtime Event Television.